Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Let me start with some home thoughts today. This is Nan June Pike made eerily accurate predictions about the future of tech 16 years before the World Wide Web. Pike coined electronic superhighway, which he said would connect cities via satellites, cables and fibre optics, according to the Tate. But I think Marshall McLuhan was ahead of him. Experimental, innovative, yet playful work has had a profound influence on today's art and culture, pioneered the use of TV and video in art and coined the phrase electronic superhighway to predict the future of communication in the internet age. This is Nixon 1965, reconstructed in 2002 and with the impeachment inquiry happening in the United States. It's quite uh, timely. And that made me go back to uh, William Golding at the moment of vision, the eyes see nothing. And this is uh, Nam June Pike again, TV Buddha from 1974. The beauty of the Masai Mara does not fade with the light. The night sky is just as mesmerizing. This photo is by Matrishva Vyas via Kenya Picks, and I'd like to go and see the Milky Way again. Sunset in the beautiful Samburu, this photo is by Solomon and Gari, and indeed the Samburu is a unique ecosystem where I'd love to go and visit, and this is a photograph I took many years ago when we visited with uh, Jacques Pitelou, who's now the Swiss ambassador to Washington, and I took this photograph of the elephants crossing the Iwaso Nero River, and it was a classic Samburu-like shot. And finally, aerial view of the newly completed Gotu Bridge. The recent rains have transformed northern Kenya into incredible landscapes. This photo is by Kieran Avery and via Isiolo Wire. New Yorker has a fascinating article, How Dreams Change Under Authoritarianism. The dreams Germans had while the Nazis were in power reveal the effects the regime had on the collective unconscious. Not long after Hitler came to power in 1933, a 30-year-old woman in Berlin had a series of uncanny dreams. In one, her neighbourhood had been stripped of its usual signs, which were replaced with posters that listed 20 verboten words. The first was Lord, and the last was I. The men brandished their bills and performed a Nazi salute, then they chanted, Your guilt cannot be doubted. These are two of about 75 dreams collected in the Third Reich of Dreams, a strange enthralling book by the writer Charlotte Barat. These dreams, these diaries of the night, were conceived independently of their author's conscious will, Barat writes. They were, so to speak, dictated to them by dictatorship. After her release, she began secretly recording the dreams of her fellow Germans for six years. As German Jews lost their homes, their jobs and their rights, Berat continued making notes. By 1939, she'd gathered 300 dreams. The project was risky, not least because she was known to the regime. Paul, who once worked for Vossische Zeitung, Germany's leading liberal newspaper, soon fled to Prague, and Berat eventually moved in with her future husband, the writer and lawyer Martin Berat. She disguised political figures, turning dreams of Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels into family anecdotes about uncles Hans, Gustav, and Gerhardt. In 1966, after retrieving her transcripts, Berat finally published the dreams in Germany as Das Dritte Reich des Traums. 
the Third Reich of Dreams unfolds over 11 chapters arranged by recurring symbols and preoccupations. Epigraphs from Arendt, Himmler, Brecht and Kafka give ballast to the surreal material that follows and chapters are titled with emblematic figures, the non-hero, those who act, and gnomic quotes such as nothing gives me pleasure anymore. These headings reinforce the book's premise that the links between waking life and dreams are indisputable, even evidentiary. In an afterword, the Austrian-born psychologist Bruno Bettelheim notes the collection's many prophetic dreams in which as early as 1933 the dreamer can recognize deep down what the system is really like. In 1933 a woman dreams of a mind reading machine, a maze of wires that detects her associating Hitler with the word devil. In one dream a 22 year old woman who believes her curved nose will mark her as Jewish attends the Bureau of Verification of Aryan Descent, not a real agency, but close enough to those of the time. At times, the Third Reich of Dreams also echoes ha Hannah Arendt, who saw totalitarian rule as truly total the moment it closes the iron vice of terror on its subjects' private social lives. The final chapter of the Third Reich of Dreams is reserved for those who, in their dreams at least, resisted the regime. I dreamed that it was forbidden to dream, but I did anyway. Later, Jewish lawyer dreams of travelling through icy Lapland to reach the last country on earth where Jews are still tolerated. But a customs official, rosy as a little marzipan pig, throws the man's passport onto the ice. Ahead, unreachable, the promised land shimmers green in the sun. It is 1935, six years later, the mass deportations would begin. Lang, who practices in Boston, learnt of Berat's work by a footnote in Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams and wrote about it in the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association. In her own practice, she has noticed a widespread uneasiness following Trump's election. She has asked her friends and colleagues to begin collecting dreams. That took me to Jorge Luis Borges. You have wakened not out of sleep, but into a prior dream, and that dream lies within another, and so on to infinity, which is the number of grains of sand the path that you are to take is endless and you will die before you have truly awakened. And my favourite, the mind was dreaming, the world was its dream. Israel assassinated a senior commander, Baha Abu al atta of the Islamic Jihad group in the Gaza Strip on Tuesday. Um, Islamic Jihad accused Israel of also targeting another of its top commanders, Akram al ajuri in the Syrian capital, Damascus. In a statement it said, two other people, including al ajuris son, were killed and warned that Israel had crossed all red lines. Israel had no comment on this attack. Um, if violence continues to get worse, Israel should hit Islamic Jihad hard. Hamas too, if involved, and then go back to crisis management, said Chuck Friley, a former deputy national security advisor. But I thought this point is the pertinent one. Any attempts to solve the long-standing conflict through solely military means will prove far more costly than the threat itself. Here in this photograph you see Palestinians inspecting the damaged house of the Islamic Jihad leader after an Israeli attack on November 12. That's via Getty Images. Power to the People, this is in Pro Syndicate by Arie Nea. From Beirut to Hong Kong to Santiago, governments are eager to bring an end to mass demonstrations. 
but in the absence of greater institutional responsiveness to popular grievances and demands, people are unlikely to stay home. People all over the world are resorting to mass demonstrations to express grievances and press unmet demands, while in some ways popular protests are a triumph of democratic principles and civic activism, they also carry serious risks, including violence by and against protesters. Their pervasiveness today points to a failure of governments, democratic and authoritarian alike, to hear, let alone meet, the needs of their people. Whether a protest movement succeeds or fails depends largely on the media. Police suppress violent protests is obviously a very different headline from police violently suppress protests and neither sends the same message as protesters and police clash. I wrote about this in an article on the 21st of, uh, of uh, October, The New Economy of Anger. I said Virilio pronounced in his book Speed and Politics, the revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production, but in the street, where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack. In other words, a producer of speed. I still think that's a deeply insightful um, sentence. And essentially, that's the only place where protesters can reach some kind of parity is by this mass protest and you can see that taking effect in Hong Kong. The phenomenon about which I'm speaking, I said, is not limited to Latin America. I spoke about the WhatsApp revolution in Lebanon, uh, Algeria, where they sent the wheelchair-bound Bouteflika home, Hong Kong, trying to shake off the crusher of bones, Xi Jinping. I said the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire, in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot, prolonged standoffs eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. Gramsci, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now is the time of monsters. I quoted Kapuczynski, if the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. And I was saying it is not over. More and more people are gathering in the streets. And unless we're now going to Xinjiang, the whole world, this current modus operandi, in my view, is running on empty. Turning now to Bolivia and the comparison between Bolivia and Venezuela, one key factor makes the Bolivia playbook a difficult one to carry out against Venezuelan President Maduro. Venezuela's armed forces have consistently refused to take the side of the protesters as Bolivia's military did, says Reuters. A Reuters special report found that Venezuela's armed forces have been heavily influenced by the presence of Cuban intelligence agents who closely monitor the communications of officers suspected of dissent. Why have the events in Bolivia not taken place in Venezuela, wrote exiled opposition leader Julio Borges on Sunday night. The explanation, he said, is in Cuba. The regime in Havana has infiltrated and kidnapped our armed forces. Our society has been pushed to the brink of a total breakdown, a police spokesman told a briefing referring to the last two days of violence. He said masked rioters had committed insane acts such as throwing trash, bicycles and other debris onto metro tracks and overhead power lines, paralyzing the transport system. The United States on Monday condemned the unjustified use of deadly force in Hong Kong and urged police and civilians alike to de-escalate the situation. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Heng Shuang urged Britain and the United States not to intrude 
saying Hong Kong affairs are purely China's internal affairs that allow no foreign interference. We urge the United States, United Kingdom and other countries to earnestly respect China's sovereignty. Do you remember Wang Yi's comment when apparently Trump was trying to encourage him to investigate Biden? And he said, look, those are your internal affairs. You see the importance of that comment he made. It essentially precludes the US from commenting on this issue. 21st of October, I wrote about the crusher of bones, Xi Jinping and his algorithmic control. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index is already down over a thousand points this week, says David Inglis, and Alibaba is likely about to come to this market. I'm not sure. I want to watch, he says. Um, the folks I wrote on the 7th of October are in, in Hong Kong are in open rebellion. Raul sent a link out on Twitter. An old friend sent me a link that Hong Kongers are using to follow what's going on. It's really outstanding and in real time, multiple live feeds. Carrie Lam said protesters are the enemy of the people. And it is simply, in my view, as I said on the 19th of August, not possible to Xinjiang Hong Kong, I think. Roger Stone previewed WikiLeaks' bounty to Trump campaign in April 26. This is Politico. <coughs> Roger Stone first told one of Trump's top aides in April 2016 that WikiLeaks had plans to dump information in the heat of the presidential race, kick-starting a scramble inside the campaign to take advantage of the expected releases. The revelation means the Trump campaign was aware of the WikiLeaks election year plans much earlier than previously understood. And it also shows that the president was involved in conversations about the issue. That's when Stone passed along initial bare-bones details about the potential Julian Assange orchestrated releases that would benefit Trump's White House bid. It was, in a way, of a gift, Gates said. He later added, we were in kind of disbelief. We believed that if information were to come out, there were a number of us that felt that it would give our campaign a leg up. <clears throat> Trump acknowledged in his answers to Mueller that he spoke with Stone from time to time during the campaign. He also said he had no recollection of the specifics of any conversations I had with Mr. Stone between June the 1st, 2016 and November the 8th, 2016. I wrote about this in an article in December 2016 called We Have a Deviate Tomahawk and I said the first thing is plausible deniability and the second thing is non-linearity. And in that I said from feeding the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online a constant state of destabilized perception. Timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks, which drained Hillary Clinton's bona fides and her turnout and motivated Trump's, what we have witnessed, I said, is something remarkable and noteworthy. International markets, 11th of November, I said my final point is that whilst the Twitter in chief is easy to read, and that was referencing an article in the South China Morning Post, I am not sure he is the decider of the trade war anymore. And I quoted T.S. Eliot, here we go round the prickly pear, here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. I also concluded that the risk of bot and algorithmic mayhem is sky high. Trump, in a big uh, speech he delivered yesterday, says they are dying to make a deal. We are the ones deciding, I like the word we, it's not I, whether or not we want to make a deal, but we will only accept a deal if it is good for the United States and our workers and our great companies, he said. In my last article, I said practically every day now and for over a year, President Trump recycles the same headline over and over again, and each time markets jump and each time it means nothing, tweeted Northman Trader. You know why algos buy unsubstantiated headlines, he said, because they are stupid. 
27th of May in an article called China versus US War Goes Ballistic. I said the point being in the trade war, Trump is no longer the decider. I said in the US there is clearly a consensus baseline for a full-on toe-to-toe -to -toe slugfest as it were. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro dollar 110.08, dollar index 98.338, Japanese yen 109.06, Swiss franc 0.9909, the pound 128.54, the Australian dollar 0.6845, but the big mover is the Kiwi, which has just popped above 64. Uh, India rupee 71.71, South Korean won 1167.60, the real has popped all the way to 416.93, Egyptian pound is steady 16.1492, they've got another big euro bond issue coming up, and the South African rand is at 1495.13. This is the dollar index, last at 98.337 and has been much firmer than I expected. Euro dollar 110.11 and then Northman Trader, the year is 2050, the US is 100 trillion dollars in debt, the Fed's balance sheet is 50 trillion dollars, a China trade deal is just around the corner. The S&P is trading five shares a day, rates are at minus 10% and everybody is a billionaire collecting income on their $15 million mortgages. And that references what I was writing in that article, the markets are by, run by machines, computers, algorithms and bots. And I was saying the risk of bot and algorithmic mayhem is sky high. And I'm not sure pumping the patient with more QE and free money will do the next, uh, will do the trick the next time around. The bots, of course, are waiting for Santa Claus and a Christmas rally. And as President Trump is wont to tweet, stock market up big today, a new record, enjoy. What a difference a decade makes. Global paradigms will change in the next 10 years with huge consequences for markets. Bank of America believes <coughs> the most contrarian trade in the 2020s is long inflation. Sees the war on inequality as bearish for assets as interest rates are at 5,000 year lows is the largest asset bubble ever. Moody's tide of populism is putting world's credit at risk. That is precisely what I was saying in the article, the new economy of anger. People have been pushed to the edge, are taking to the streets. The phenomenon is spreading like wildfire, in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot, prolonged standoffs, eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities, and accelerate the negative feedback loop. Commodity markets gold is getting a bit of a lift, last at 14.61. Crude oil, this is a tweet from Adam Mancini, admittedly from November the 11th, where he said it looks set for another leg higher. For the past week or so, it's been going sideways to form a very nice bull flag. If this breaks out, it would target $59 at least, or $60.50, and I subscribe to that and think he'll get a bit of a lift from the Crown Prince as he seeks to sell some of his Aramco. The emerging markets in a televised news conference, the Central Bank Governor of Lebanon, Riyad Salama, said capital controls were not on the table and there would be no haircut or value reduction on deposits. And that takes me back to the WhatsApp revolution in Lebanon and that rather fantastic song which I had on loop all weekend from, I think, Ron Saikaili. Um, and, you know, this is the economy of anger and we can, you know, Lebanon is another very good example. The Brazilian real continues putting in huge moves, tweeted the market here, tweeted this chart, we're at 14.1693. And that took me back to Bolsonaro at Unga, where he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And he spoke of trails of death and destruction, ideologically infected human souls and biologically perverted children, which I will just leave out there because his intervention in fact left me speechless. 
Let's turn to Africa. This is a video that was uh, posted by Samira Solani. 86-year-old Paul Beer is one year into his seventh term as president of Cameroon. And here he's seen arriving in Paris for a peace summit. I concluded by saying the gerontocracy leads the continent with the youngest population in the world. Demographic dividend or demographic terminator was uh, something I was asking when in 2014 when Ouagadougou um, uh, had that uh, toppling of beautiful Blaise Compaore. Each year from now until 2030, 29 million Africans will reach working age, according to the Africa report. The Africa to Asia labor productivity ratio has decreased from 67% in 2000 to 50% today, the report finds. African exports of consumption goods to African markets decreased between 2009 and 2016, both in dollar terms and relative to the continent's GDP. Annual total of 29 million new entrants to Africa's labor markets risks becoming a cumulative addition to the jobless total. If jobs for them are not found in one year, they will need to be created the next year. IS claims it took control of a town in Cabo Delgado, a region of Mozambique. That's according to Azeline. Of course, Russia has sent some of their political technologists to deal with the situation. South African oil shares up 6.94% year to date. Dollar Rand lasted 14.9457, practically bang in the middle of that 1450, 15, range. I've spoken about Egyptian pound, strong at 16.1393. EGX 30 up 12.54% year to date. Combination of a strong Naira and tariffs meant big profits have accrued to those who smuggled rice and other goods into Nigeria and sold subsidized Nigerian petrol across the borders. That's from Charlie Robertson. Closing the borders is one attempt to address the leakages. Stopping fuel sales is another. The Nigerian all shares down 15.83% year-to-date. The African Development Bank, Credit Suisse and ICBC and the Ghana Cocoa Board signed a $600 million syndicated receivables-backed term loan at the Africa Investment Forum. Ghana Stock Exchange is down 13.15%. The Intercept has it at very interesting investigative piece, the Comoros Connection, how Joe Lowe, wanted for history's biggest heist, parked his money at an obscure Kuwaiti-owned bank in the Comoros Islands. The financier made friends in high places. He dined with Leonardo DiCaprio, bought diamonds for supermodel Miranda Kerr, and even financed the film production company that made The Wolf of Wall Street. He went into business with Gulf Royals and real estate moguls from Abu Dhabi. Lowe's high-flying ways even brought him into alleged criminal conspiracies with an American rapper and landed him on the receiving end of a Justice Department indictment for laundering billions. Some of the business deals prosecutors said were part of an expansive effort to launder misappropriated public funds. On the Comoro Islands, an archipelago nation in the Indian Ocean, Sabah, who was his business partner, is a big deal. When he visits the capital, Moroni, newspapers put him on the cover. When he promises closer diplomatic ties and greater foreign investment, Comorian officials rejoice. Though he's not involved in politics back home, he's received and acts like a diplomatic envoy because of his family's position in Kuwait. On a trip to the islands in December 2017, he met the country's president and pledged to renew his commitments to supporting the Comorian economy. Sabah had other reasons to travel to Comoros that winter. The bank, the Banque Federale de Commerce, a small commercial bank, that he chaired and owned in full had been giving him a headache for almost two years. According to the bank's former general manager, a Lebanese man named Amine Halawi, Sabah helped Lowe and Tan Kim Lung 
a frequent associate of Lowe's, also known as Eric Tan or Fat Eric, opened offshore accounts at the Banque Federale de Commerce in the summer of 2016. It's an extraordinary story. During the apartheid era, for instance, Comoros was a hub for gun runners working for sanctioned South Africans. Um, Sabah uh, talked to lawmakers into selling more than 40,000 Comorian passports to the government of the UAE, known as the Economic Citizenship Program. The deal was due to net the Comoros $200 million dollars much of it earmarked to give Kiwan and Sabah's local firm, Comoro Gulf Holdings, contracts to build infrastructure that the island still desperately needs. Under Halawi's watch, the bank started lending to ordinary Comorians. Halawi rented a house and adopted two German shepherd puppies, Anna and Puji. Then there's this important visit to the island's delegation, including Joe Loy, would be arriving the next day in Moroni and the whole group of them, they never turned up in point of fact. The bank has managed to survive. This past summer, a Mauritian named Azad Domu was appointed the Banque Federale de Commerce's general manager. Domu said he would help transform the Comoros Islands into the Switzerland of the Indian Ocean. You can't make it up. This is a photograph of fishermen returning from the sea in their skiff in Moroni, the capital of the volcanic Comoros archipelago. And this is a photograph of the sunset in the Comoros. Turning to Kenya, Kenya needs at least $15 billion for universal power access. Um, Realisation, of course, is dependent on various factors, including the financing available. Uh, Kenya renewable uh, electricity, about 12.6% of its existing connections are off-grid, 874 on the national network. Based on 2016 data, Kenya's per capita power consumption is about 173 kilowatt hours. Compares with 117 in Tanzania, 99 in Ethiopia, 85 in Uganda, and 46 in Rwanda, according to Renaissance. For nations to be industrialized, adult literacy needs to be at least 70 percent, and electricity consumption at a minimum of 300 kilowatt hours per person to have a big manufacturing sector, which means contributing 20% of economic output, according to Charlie of Renka. This is Mombasa, folks, Moy Avenue. That's from Mombasa CGW. Pretty extraordinary. Kenya Silverstone Air suspended all flights. This has been, uh, uh, caught, you know, there's been a huge PR contest. The matter is, when you come to airlines and people's safety, you can't play fast and loose with your PR which is what Silverstone had been doing. Incredible story in Sky News, the stowaway, who was the man who fell from the sky? On 30th June 2019, a man fell from the sky and landed in the back garden of a house in South London, um, created a hole in the garden just three feet from the end of his sun bed. It had taken only 20 seconds or so for him to plummet from a Kenya Airways passenger plane he had hidden in the Boeing 787's landing compartment and fallen when the wheels were lowered for landing. The stairway was probably dead before he hit the ground. The plane had spent eight hours at 37,000 feet where oxygen levels are thin and the cold is colder than any deep freeze. Passengers are protected in a pressurized cabin, but the stairway was subjected to the elements. The police said the incident was not being treated as suspicious. No one seems to know the stairway. This individual came from somewhere. Sky News wanted to find out more. Uh, began their hunt at the biggest airport in Kenya on the assumption the stairway had probably worked there. Got a break from an Uber driver called Kamal. I'd been following the stairway story, he said, as he bossed his Toyota Corolla around the airport. Anybody gone missing? I asked. Yes, a cleaner from Colnet. He went missing around the same time. Some airport workers were talking about it. From there, Colnet is one of a dozen of firms providing services at JKIA, deploys hundreds of people as cleaners. A woman called Irene said she could help us. The last time I saw him, we were at work. He suddenly disappeared. Nobody knows where he went. I called his phone. It was off. Um, told by the company to keep it a secret. Yes, she had some photos of Paul, who was 29 and she told us they'd been in a relationship for two years. 
Irene told us that Paul was living in a slum called Makuru Kwanjenga. He would not choose to live there. Slum is dirty and unsafe. Shared a room with a man called Patrick. Paul was a friend of mine. We came from the same county, the same school, and I was working at Colnet. So I took him to the company and we started together. He was dreaming of something more. Um, and then uh, uh, they speak to an aviation expert. I just don't understand how anyone can survive. It is beyond comprehension to think you could survive at minus 60 degrees centigrade for eight or nine hours. There's so little oxygen that your body starts pumping it back out into the air. You couldn't hold your breath even for a minute. They go to Nairobi's airport, the KAA, and ask them for a response to the, our findings. We ask them whether they agree with our conclusions about Paul Magnassi. Furthermore, we asked whether his presence as a stairway on a passenger jet would constitute a security breach at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. They did not reply. Went to the cleaning company Colnet, um, wanted to confirm that their 29-year-old worker went missing at the end of June. They did not reply either. Uh, went and saw the family in Kakamega. Has anyone been in touch with you? I asked. No one, he said. Um, I didn't know where to start or where to end. I don't know who to ask. Paul's phone isn't working. I asked the pair how they wanted to proceed. These are his parents, but Mr. Magnassi said there was nothing he could do. With a large family to feed, he could not afford to bring Paul home. Let him stay in the UK. There are too many expenses. Soil is just soil. This is a photograph of the Uber driver, Kamal. This is, I, this is a photograph of Paul, who was planning to have a family with Irene. This is the, a photograph of the slum area of Makuru Kwajenga, which is on the road to the airport. On that note, we know uh, Silverstone has suspended all their flights. Nairobi all shares up 11.81% year-to-date. Equity Bank reported Q3 results through 2019. Let me take you through those. Equity Bank reported very strong results, Q3, um, up profit up tax up of, above 10%. But what I found interesting was the regional breakdown. Rwanda up 35%, DR Congo up 33%, Uganda up 14%, South Sudan, as you'd expect, down 50%, and Tanzania down a whopping 81%. Nevertheless, very strong results from uh, Dr. Mwangi, very mercurial see Chief Executive Officer, and clearly it's a bank worth betting on. Thank you for stopping. Bye.